William Shire's Rise and Fall of the Third Reich is huge, it's ambitious, it's widely read, it provides an incredibly in-depth view behind the curtain of the Nazi governmental functions and diplomatic maneuvering from the rise of Hitler to the fall of the Third Reich. And while that might be of some value, the book has many problems that are only growing worse with age. Let's take a look at why I think it's time to leave this book behind. Number 1. Top Down vs. Bottom Up To explain one of the biggest problems with this book, we need to discuss narrative history. When writing a narrative history, academics and journalists usually take one of two paths. The first is known as Top Down. These make up a huge number of histories. Top-down history looks at politicians, generals, diplomats, and other important figures as the major gears that drive history. The other narrative framework is bottom-up history. This looks at the salt of the earth people. These works focus on what history was like for regular people and how they were impacted by it, but also how they impacted it. Let's take a look at Cornelius Ryan's 1966 book, The Last Battle. In describing life in Berlin in anticipation of the arrival of the Soviets, Ryan starts with regular people. On page 16, he's describing the experiences of a milkman. He covers nuns and women fearing assault and rape as reprisals for German war crimes in the USSR. He even talks about how dietary restrictions affected animals at the Berlin Zoo. These stories add texture to history and widen the scope to include regular people, and they are almost completely absent from Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. This just isn't how history is done in a more modern way. Number 2. A Diplomatic History of Nazi Germany This book, and all of its scope, is a very top-down diplomatic history of Nazi Germany. Shire lays out that most of his sources are from internal diplomatic and military Nazi documents that were captured by the Allies at the end of World War II. For the size of this book, the focus is on the rise of Hitler and how he and some other high-ranking Nazis navigated Germany through World War II. It's written in a narrative fashion and can be really gripping at times, but events like the Anschluss are portrayed entirely through the lens of Hitler and his lieutenants dealing with Austrian Prime Minister Schuschnigg. It's all from the top. The Czechoslovak crises, the war itself, everything here focuses on diplomatic and political moves by high-ranking Nazis and people reacting to them. This is perfectly exemplified when Shire describes the mood in Berlin before the attack on Poland. He does this from his own perspective without using newspapers, diaries, letters, or any source that shows what regular Germans felt like. He says the mood was kind of bland and unremarkable on page 597, but this is all based on his thoughts and personal observations. While he is a primary source because he was there, he really should be corroborating this with other newspapers, diaries, letters, or anything that shows the perspective of the regular Germans. He talks about Nazi terror, but he uses numbers and policy statements from the top to describe them without going into sources from the people who actually lived through those atrocities. If you go into reading this only wondering what was happening politically and diplomatically in Germany, then that's fine. But the game has changed, and history is more than just what the people at the top did. It's more than diplomats, generals, dictators, and other politicians. If you want this type of history where you have a play-by-play -play and get to see behind the scenes based on what the big figures at the top were doing, then you might like this book and it has something valuable. If you want a deeper analysis, it still has a few more problems. Number 3. The Zonderweg Problem Another huge issue with this work is Shire's take on the Zonderweg. But in general, Zonderweg is a school of thought that means special way in German. A simplification of it is that Zonderweg historians believe that Germany has a unique history with being divided during the Holy Roman Empire, being the seat of the Protestant Reformation, having Prussia and Austria compete with each other. This all led to Germany having an incredibly unique path to nationalism and later nationhood. Again, this is a huge simplification of their arguments, but Germany had a strange history and it made them experience nationalism strangely. The reason I bring this up is that Shire takes this to about as extreme an end as the Sonderweg goes. He argues that between Prussian absolutism and the Kaiser and Bismarck's views on liberalism, that the Germans were almost destined to allow for the rise of fascism in Hitler. He's basically saying that the German people were conditioned throughout their whole history to accept a totalitarian regime. Basically, when he says that, he's saying that the rise of Hitler or some other dictator like Hitler was inevitable. 
Zondervegg as an academic framework has already fallen out of favor, and then Shire is completely reaching when he makes this argument even within their framework. A lot of this book is an indictment of the German people, even though he doesn't really share the stories of regular Germans. Shire says in the afterword, quote, have the Germans changed? I myself am not sure. My view no doubt clouded by the personal experience of having lived and worked in Germany in the Nazi time. And he goes on to ask, quote, is there a solution to the German problem? History is complicated, and so this argument can really be a problem in understanding how the Germans did allow for the rise of fascism. It makes it harder to compare fascism in other places and to try to understand the roots of the issue. Number four, weird moralizing. When he isn't arguing that Germans were innately built to be fascist, a lot of his focus on what makes a person a Nazi comes down to personal morals. He is oddly obsessed with the Nazi party members' sexuality, their drinking habits, and their marital fidelity. On page 39, talking about the birth of the Nazi party, he introduces Dietrich Eckhart as that hard-drinking poet, and refers to Ernst Ruhm as the homosexual Ruhm. He even states later that Ruhm was, albeit like so many of the early Nazis, a homosexual. He even later summarizes the Nazi party saying, As we have seen, a conglomeration of pimps, murderers, homosexuals, alcoholics, and blackmailers flock to the party as if to a natural haven. It's hard to look like a serious analysis of how Hitler rose when he is so subjective and does all this weird moralizing. He also critiques the intelligence of different actors in the book, sometimes with quotes, sometimes with his own opinion. You can tell his background was news because this reads like an opinion piece at times. The real danger is if someone reads this book and asks the question, why did people become Nazis? Shire's answer is they were gay, alcoholic, and German. This book blocks off deeper analysis that we see in books like Christopher Browning's Ordinary Men or Omer Bartov's Barbarization and Warfare. A serious analysis would dive deeper into how regular people came to believe and follow the Nazis and carry out their agenda and not focus on the personalities or personal failings of these men. The evil comes from the action of the Nazis and Shire seems to lose sight of this. Number 5. Taking the Generals at Face Value if you've seen my review of Heinz Guderian's Panzer Leader, which I'll link up here, you know that a historian has to scrutinize even primary sources and memoirs from people who were there. Shire doesn't. While he calls out the German generals at times for failing to get rid of Hitler, he also takes their word at face value. While talking about the invasion of Poland, Shire spreads a famous myth, quote, Horses against tanks, the cavalrymen's long lance against the tank's long cannon. Brave and valiant and foolhardy though they were, the Poles were simply overwhelmed by the German onslaught. Poland had the 7T tank, and their cavalry were more like dragoons who would dismount and fight using carbines, grenades, machine guns, anti-tank guns, mortars. They didn't charge with lances, and they weren't stupid. This shows a problem with many works written between the 1950s and 60s in that they just quote the German generals and leave well enough alone. Newer works are far more critical and better about avoiding such myths. Overall, if you want a narrative history of all the diplomatic and political situations during the Third Reich, then I would recommend this book. It really does break down the diplomatic events in an easy-to-consume, play-by-play type of way with lots of internal documents from the Nazis. The book uses many diplomatic cables between Nazi Germany and other nations during important events before and during the war. And it is cross-referenced with those internal Nazi documents to provide insight into how and why the Nazis did what they did during events like the Anschluss, Sudeten Crisis, etc., etc. Shire was a reporter and was in Germany for many of these events, so you can take him and his thoughts as a primary source. Then his bias makes more sense considering he wrote about it as a contemporary. As a secondary source though, there shouldn't be this type of analysis and it really does fall flat. If you want to hear about what living under the Third Reich was like for regular people, then you may want to look elsewhere. If you want insight into how Hitler rose to power or why regular people could become Nazis, then I would really ask that you're careful if you read this. It doesn't focus on regular people, it doesn't have sources for those who weren't in the government or military or high up in the diplomatic functions, and it loses a lot of its analytical qualities by falling into myths, stereotypes, moralizing, and other subjective ideas. I may sound rude saying this, but it is very obviously written by a journalist and not an academic.
Thank you guys for watching. If you liked it and want more book reviews and World War II content, please comment, like, and share the video. Subscribe for more historical videos and Wargame Wednesdays, and as always, stay excited about history.